Hi, this is Dr. A with our next video in the Basics of the Lab series. We're going to look at hemostasis and coagulation. So what is hemostasis? Hemostasis is the cessation of blood flow from an injured blood vessel. The steps involved in hemostasis are first vasoconstriction, so that's the constriction of the damaged blood vessel that to decrease blood flow through the injured area that also prevents um, entry uh, for materials in there. Then uh, the platelets are going to be activated and are going to adhere or stick to da the damaged area of the blood vessels and then to each other and it will form a platelet plug. And then next there's a coagulation portion um, that starts and that's the formation of a fibrin network to clot or to stop the bleeding completely. Um, and so with those three steps, once everything is completed, the bleeding should stop at the injury site. Coagulation in itself, so as a portion of hemostasis, is degeneration of the thrombin in blood plasma, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin. And fibrin is the mesh part of the clot. And uh, that mesh part of the clot is going to form around those platelets and then it's going to trap red cells in there and then that will effectively plug the damaged area. The coagulation factors that are involved in coagulation are approximately 17 glycoproteins that are essential for coagulation to occur. There are a few other molecules that are essential that are not proteins uh, and these are calcium, factor 4, and platelet phospholipid, which is also known as PPL, platelet factor 3, or PF3. Those three are not proteins. The coagulation cascade is a series of biochemical reactions in which an inactive proenzyme, or an inactive protein, if you will, are converted to an active enzyme or an active protein. And, um, and that, in turn, will activate the another one, another proenzyme. And so um, there is a cascade of factor activities. Think of it as dominoes falling and hitting each other. So one activates the next, which activates the next, which activates the next. It is called a cascade because each activated factor serves as a catalyst that activates or starts or amplifies the next reaction. That cascade is divided into three parts. We have the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways. All right, so here's a good recap of th these. So we'll start with the intrinsic pathway. This pathway is triggered by surface contact, and the surface contact is going to activate factor 12 into factor 12A. So the little A here means it's the active form of factor 12. Now, 12A then is going to find factor 11 and activate it into 11A. And then 11A is going to find factor 9 and activate it into 9A. And then factor 9A, along with factor 8, the uh, platelet membrane phospholipids, and calcium is going to activate factor 10 into 10A. Okay, and so that's part of the intrinsic pathway. On the other side, the extrinsic pathway, tissue damage will activate factor 7 and 2, tissue factor 7A, and then that 7A activates factor 10 into 10A. And so once we have 10A, we're in the common pathway, and then 10A with factor 5, the platelet membrane phospholipid in calcium is going to find prothrombin that's floating around in the blood and activate it into thrombin. And then thrombin with serine protease is going to find fibrinogen, which is again floating in the blood, inactive, and activate it into fibrin. And it is also going to find factor 13 and make it into 13A. And with fibrin in 13A, there's the formation of a stable fibrin clot. So how do we test for coagulation and coagulation issues? The most commonly performed coagulation tests are going to be the prothrombin time, PT. Also, um, usually PT-INR is how it uh, shows up in testing menus. 
The activated partial thromboplastin time, also known as the PTT or APTT, the activated clotting time, the fibrinogen assay, and the thrombin time. So let's look at the specimen requirement because uh, any good test starts with a good specimen. And uh, it is very important to get accurate COAG testing results to have the proper specimen. So blood should be collected into a vacuum tube that contains 3.2% sodium saturate. It is a light blue top of this color. The blood to anticoagulant ratio in the tube should be nine parts the blood to one part of sodium citrate. So if the tube is properly filled to its capacity, then that ratio should be accurate. If the tube is only halfway filled, then we wouldn't have a nine to one ratio. We might have a four or five to one, and that's not good. Um, if that happens, if that tube is not properly filled, then uh, that can cause erroneous results, and we do not want that to cause misdiagnosis. The prothrombin time PT, uh, again also known as PT and INR, uh, it is the test that is used to assess deficiencies in the extrinsic and common pathways. That extrinsic pathway was that really short one with the tissue damage activation. The most commonly used test to monitor the effect of oral anticoagulant therapy, so the PTINR, um, and uh, it monitors the vitamin, K and vitamin K antagonists that include warfarin or coumadin, which are oral anticoagulants that patients can take. Those are not some of the uh, newer drugs that are being advertised. So these are more of the um, traditional Drugs that have been on the market for decades. These are also very, very affordable and very effective. Um, so the PT will always include the INR, the International Normalized Ratio, and uh, use INR to um, guide anticoagulation therapy for the patient. So why do we have an INR? Why can't we just use the normal range for the PT? Well, what happens is there are variations between labs, between instruments, with reagents, et cetera. So normally, a normal range for the prothrombin time is around 10 to 13 seconds, but you can see variations. So in one lab, maybe it's 10.5 to 12 or 9 to 11. And um, so they developed the INR to standardize everything. And so if um, the normal, uh, a normal patient as uh, PT is in a normal range, then their INR should be one. If they are on Coumadin or Warfarin and their, um, you know, their blood has been thinned by that, then their INR might be two or 2.5, meaning it would take them twice as long as a normal person to stop bleeding. Okay. And so, the INR value is used to uh, guide uh, the dosage of their <coughs> anticoagulation therapy at home. The, uh, an elevation of BT INR could be caused also by lupus anticoagulants and by heparin or heparin therapy. And this is obviously in addition to them being on warfarin or coumadin, and then you would expect an elevated PT INR. The next one is the PTT, or Activated Partial Thromboplastin Time. The test is used to screen for deficiencies uh, and inhibitors that are in the intrinsic pathway, which was the much longer pathway that we uh, looked at, the first one we looked at, as well as factors in that final common pathways. It is commonly used to monitor therapy with unfractionated heparin. Unfractionated heparin is what would be given to patients uh, in the hospital that um, present themselves with blood clots, whether it's in a leg or a vein or somewhere in, and they need to be dissolved, heparin is going to be the therapy of choice. Whereas uh, the Coumadin and Warfarin that we talked about for the PT is an at-home treatment that is long-term for these patients that have clotting issues to prevent them from having clots again, for ha from having another DVT or another blood clot in the lung. The normal range for the PTT is going to vary by manufacturer, so uh, you just have to look on the lab report 
because again, there's variations between the reagent, reagent types, um, analyzers, etc. The most common causes of a prolonged APTT are going to be, again, the lupus and anticoagulants, the heparin, and you would expect it to be prolonged because that's what the heparin does is it prolongs the PTT, but also liver dysfunction. And liver dysfunction, if it's severe enough, can also uh, interfere with the PT. A vitamin K deficiency, which uh, again would also prolong the PT. Warfarin or Coumadin therapy, which again would prolong the PT and the PTT. Disseminated intravascular coagulation. So if you don't know what that is, I'll briefly say it's a problem where um, there are microclots forming all over the body, and there's a consumption then of all the coagulation factors, which then would lengthen the PT and the PTT time. Uh, and use of platelets and use of blood cells, um, and so it's a clotting problem. And then um, once all of those are used up, then it turns into a bleeding problem. And this is a very severe uh, issue, and um, you would see this in um, maybe ICU patients. And then there are certain hereditary factors that can cause a prolonged PTT. The activated clotting time is a test that is frequently used to monitor heparin therapy during procedures that require moderate to high doses of heparin. The normal range is 80 to 130 seconds, but it can vary by analyzer. It is usually a point of care analyzer, a small one that's done at the bedside. It is performed on whole blood or on citrated whole blood, uh, so again, that blue top rather than plasma, uh, because it's checking the clotting ability of the blood, and so you have to have the red cells and the platelets and all that in there. Um, an increase in the activated clotting time could be caused by the test method, the blood volume to be tested, uh, the technique of the detect that's collecting and running the test, the sample temperature, and then hemodilution as in if the blood is diluted by uh, a lot of fluids that are being given during that procedure. And then the fibrinogen assay, it is a test that is most commonly used to assess fibrinogen concentration. Uh, so you always have some fibrinogen that's in there that's, you know, it's in, inactive so that it can be activated to fibrin. Uh, normal range is 200 to 400 milligrams per DL. Uh, fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. This means that when there is an acute inflammation or acute in, um, illness, infection, that this is a protein whose levels are going to go up. Okay, So that is what it's meant when you see the word it is an acute phase reactant. It means that fibrinogen levels will go up in an acute event like an acute infection or acute inflammation. They can also be elevated in pregnancy and in coronary disease. Um, and a decreased fibrinogen is associated with the similar intravascular coagulation, which I just explained a few minutes ago. And then the last test is the thrombin time. It is the most sensitive test for fibrin deficiency. It assesses the ability to convert fibrinogen to a fibrin clot. And the normal range is 25 to 35 seconds. And it can be prolonged when uh, fibrinogen's concentration is below 100 milligrams per DL, which makes sense because you can't have fibrin without fibrinogen. So there you go. And that wraps up our basics of hemostasis and coagulation. Thank you.